Hi and welcome to episode 22 of Beating BDD, a podcast about body dysmorphic disorder from the BDD Foundation in the UK. I'm Claire Atherton and for this episode I spoke to Andy Hall about his BDD. Ten years ago Andy used to spend eight hours a day in front of the mirror and couldn't imagine ever being able to function. Now he works full time as a social worker and describes himself as 90 to 95% recovered. Here's his story. So hi Andy, welcome to the Beating BGD podcast. Thanks so much for coming on. Hello, how are you? I'm very well. We're, we're both quite excited today because we're actually sitting on a prop, in a proper podcast studio on a boat called the Boat Pod because recording at home has been so dreadful during the pandemic, hasn't it? And we actually did a recording before that I had to ask you to redo because it was so bad. I'm not worried. I'm, I'm <laughs> quite quite giddy right now, as you can tell by the sort of the shaking hands. I thought you wouldn't mind coming back because you did seem to enjoy it the first time. Yeah, so. yeah. This is, most, this is a mix of like joy and caffeine all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we did the previous recording, we had a very, very good chat. Um, you were saying that you're 90 to 95% better from BDD these days. So what does that mean in practice? What would you like listeners to know about how that feels? Just for a second, but you're going to say 19. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but yeah, I, I think that in terms of sort of what, what day-to-day life, I, I think I imagined when I began my recovery thinking that it would look like a, a sort of a, a daily, oh, I'm so happy and full of joy. And, and of course, that's that's not the reality for anybody when they're in, a, I think, a, a healthy position. You know, you have the, the highs and the positives, but there's also a normal amount of just day to day, isn't there? And the, the occasional lows, because that's that's life. But I think that in terms of specifics, I I would say that I feel... I think there's just, there's a, just a, a nice calm more than anything. And then suddenly there are those moments of where I go, oh, I, I don't do that anymore in that way. I don't think that way or behave that way. And, you know, I think that I find myself noting what I'm not doing more of what than what I do do. And I think that's the that's the real change is that whether it's, I find myself sort of thinking, oh my goodness, I can't remember the last time I actually really mirror checked in, in, a, in an unhealthy way that made me feel really anxious. Or I can't remember the last time I looked in a, a car window or a shop window to check my appearance and and that kind of thing. And I think that's that's the real differences in terms of just how I'm no longer distracted from the things I want to do. Mm, that's fantastic. You also said something interesting, which was that um, when you used to tell people how you felt about yourself, they would say, but you're a good looking person. So what would you say to someone who might Google you and say, well, he's a perfectly nice looking man. What's, of course he's feeling better. <laughs> See, Claire, it must be very hard for you, Sat. So close to an Adonis in real life, you know. Yes, I've, es- I've escaped the Greek pantheon to join you today. But um, no, I mean, I think that it's the classic eye of the beholder situation, isn't it? Is that my experiences of of school and and bullying and and developing BDD mean that when I was you know up, up until I was about twenty, I had such poor self esteem based on my appearance that like anybody else with BDD, I saw myself in a certain way which others didn't. And you know I, I think it would be remiss to pretend that you know that, that with the the very high with the highly image focused you know nature of society and the sort of you know the, the idea that what is beautiful is good and so forth and, and all those biases I won't pretend that there aren't you know I think that my life in certain ways won't have been easier as I've recovered because I've gone I've been able to think oh do you know what actually I'm, I'm listening to people saying nice things about the way I look now that's that's very that's helpful I think that at, on the same time I'm sorry at the same time there is a, another side to that which is quite well, it's it's interesting because I think when people say nice things about you and you don't feel that way, then they, that can come with an interesting degree of shame. And also, I think that when someone says, "Oh, but you know, but you look this way," how can you think otherwise? If if you try and build up that resource of, "Yeah, do you know what? I'm going to get comfortable with the way I look." Interestingly, with obsessive and compulsive thinking, it then becomes this sometimes a worry of, "But what if I lose?" that which I've sought for a long time, which is a feeling of, you know, contentment or positivity about my image. Because of course, the other side of that beauty obsession in society is the idea of, oh my God, look how ugly they are now. They've gotten old. My God, look, their faces, you know, and you can, so it was, I think focusing on the middle ground is, is the helpful thing for me, you know, looking at the parts of life that aren't to do with body image and the things that I enjoy that give me a, a nice sense of purpose. Yeah, that was um, brings me on to what I was going to ask you about next, actually, is how you think having BDD has changed what you value in yourself and others. 
Well, I think that by nature of getting older, you shift from a position of focusing in you know, highly as a teenager, in my experience, because of course I can only speak from my experience, you know, about um, you know, body image and things like popularity and status. And I came from a very small town with, you know, and so then you move somewhere like London and it's a hugely different kettle of fish. I studied in Birmingham, similar situation. And I think that when you, when I realised over time that everybody kind of thinks in you know these these sort of ways at certain points, but then well we we grow, don't we? And I think that it's you surround yourself with people who are on a, a, the same kind of wavelength of focusing on I don't know whether it's doing something like this and trying to help other people with your experiences in the way that you can, or focusing on something that you're passionate about in your job. You know, <laughs> during lockdown, I. Uh, started quite literally bird watching so i was like do you know what there's not much else to do these are nice aren't they no, you know there's a pied wagtail that, that one you know like it's just these little things that make life that give you nice grounding that's what i like to focus on mm, yeah mm. interesting so are you comfortable now to go back and just tell me um your bdd story so when it started what you think brought it on and then just in as many or as few words as you want no worries yeah so i think when i was i think I remember little sort of blips at points of my sort of earlier childhood that I that I don't think I were necessarily beady, but obsessive compulsive behaviours. So I can remember playing in the garden and and repeating these verbal rituals that like um, so believing that if I didn't repeat them, then I just couldn't continue what I was doing. I had I had to keep saying these things over and over and over again, like sort of. Uh, almost like capturing a screen, a snapshot in time, or almost like saving a video game. That was how I thought of it in my life. Like, I'm uh, sorry, at, at the time, I thought by you know doing this. And then these, I remember I hit puberty, and I became incredibly obsessed with body hair. I was terrified of like my my body changing. And I don't really know why. I think maybe it's the the societal pressures I mentioned earlier, the the context of what we grew up in. And I was, you know, that that sort of happened and then when I was about 17 um, I decided after many years of unfortunately being bullied for having you know large ears that stuck out I decided you know what I will I'll have these pinned back and I think that <clears throat> I I hadn't really put two and two together for quite a long time um, and there was a, a nice period from between about 14 to 16 or so, where I grew my hair, I didn't worry about my ears, and I had a re I really enjoyed that that time in my life. And then I went to a, a grammar school, and the the expectations and the norms about appearance were different. You, had, you know, there was, you know, you 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 had short hair and so forth. And I thought, well, <laughs> this is terrifying and highly unfortunate, and <laughs> not part of the plan. So I then had to, well, I had to. I felt as if I had to take certain measures and. My mum reminds me that when I was really little, um, apparently I was asked if I wanted to go to the doctor and talk about my ears. And I said, no, because people should accept me for who I am. Terrible. Mm. Awful idea. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> how foolish of me. No, no. And I think that's lovely. That's a one, I love how children in particular, so I work with children, is that purity and that kind of, that, that part of life I love. Um, but of course, unfortunately, at the time I was about 17, I thought, right, well, I will have to have my ears pinned back. And I can remember the moment I kind of consider when I started my BBD was the looking in the mirror as the bandages came off. And it was this moment of things didn't seem quite right. And I didn't really know what that meant. I mean, I, I can remember this sort of sinking feeling. And the first time I really felt that sinking feeling in my chest of, oh, God, there's something wrong with me. And there's, this is not what I wanted. This is not how I should look. Should's a terrible word. <laughs> um, and and I can remember thinking this just isn't right. And and then it kind of unfortunately began from there. I, I, I well it, it escalated from there and became very very prominent and, and in my focus about you know my ears and using my hair to cover my ears or the proportion between my ears and the rest of my head. Great time. <laughs> and then I unfortunately I, I went uh, I worked in a a care home with dementia uh, residents for about a year and I can remember this really sort of pivotal moment of like where you know obviously in, in that role which was incredible for me it really helped me grow up quite quickly um, at that point in my life 
you know, where you're caring for people who are very vulnerable and often because of their, you know, their their health, they, they weren't sort of, you know, obviously aware as much of their environments in, in, in the same sort of way. And interestingly, I had a, a lady look at me when she saw me looking in a, in a mirror and, or a glass window and she just had this moment of clarity and said to me, you look fine. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> the jig is up. But um, is that the word? Jig? Anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Yeah, so that was that was interesting. And then I went traveling with a friend and, and unfortunately I don't really remember it very well because I was so unwell. Um and and briefly went to university to study, left, and then quickly started accessing um uh, more th- well, therapy for the first time. And and that was kind of the beginning of the recovery, although I didn't really know it yet. Mm-hmm. So I I ended up having some C B D. Uh, sorry, CBT, CBD, <laughs> you didn't listen, pump me full of oils. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> That's later, but you know, good stuff, Holland and Barrett. But um, in terms of, you know, the, that part of the recovery, I think I was just kind of getting to grips with things to start with. And I had six months of NHS therapy and then a few, I was like, okay, well, I need, you know, that ended. So I started, you know, I paid with some private therapy and, and then Unfortunately, I don't think the therapist and I were particularly a good match. She didn't. I remember she came to a therapy session and she was like, "I've printed off my notes on BDD." I thought, "You're not uh-huh. really, you're not really <laughs> filling me with confidence here." <laughs> like, <laughs> wonderful news. I put my shoes on today. <laughs> we're both doing great. So, um, and then unfortunately, after about three months, um, I of that, so nine months in total, I was like, "Okay, I think this is a, still a physical problem." So I then decided to have another surgery. And it's it's a it's a really sensitive topic, not so much to me, but I think just in terms of people who might hear this, is that I feel that the surgery that I had, you know, it it made me quote unquote happier than my first surgery, but I almost immediately had an enormous blip and had to be hospitalized because I was just so unhappy still. And I think it this is the real danger, isn't it? Is that like you know, objectively, I had quite large sticking out ears at certain points. But actually, looking back at photographs, when I had this second surgery, I look back at beforehand, and I'm like, I actually look fine. I quite like mm. how I looked, mm. interestingly, in mm. hindsight. So in the moment, it was a panic. Like, I've got to do this. I have to, I can, you know. But then what really made the difference you know what because I, I again i i don't want to advocate for surgery but i also understand that at that point in my life it was it felt like it was the only choice mm-hmm. at that point but what actually made the difference was the further therapy that i had which was absolutely fantastic it was through a um an anxiety disorders unit in for, uh, attached to the university of bath which unfortunately i think is closed now um <clears throat> but i had this absolutely fantastic um therapy duo um um, yeah called uh claire and my brain has shut down and it was great uh james james yeah wow (laughs) shout out to them but um yeah no they were they were absolutely fantastic and and they really in three months everything changed and it was that exposure response prevention therapy you know particular bdd specialized cbt rather than generic and i think that it really it really did make the difference and and then of course it was a couple of years of like cementing things but things did very quickly move forward and like i said i'm I, because of that therapy i can now look back at pictures and so forth from before this surgery and think actually do you know what i looked okay mm-hmm. and you know and i think that's it isn't it is that the the psychological support is is the light was the lifesaver but um but yeah as i say i think it's over the last sort of the 10 years since then things have got enormously better you know that my life is no well i think to, to be to be frank no one's life is without body image moments even if it's a slight moment of oh I'd like to, you know, oh, I need to brush my hair. You know what I mean? We, we have that because of the world we live in and because of, I think, our, just our biological drives, don't we, and all the rest. But I would absolutely say that I am enormously happier and healthier than ever. And and that's, as I said, it's not like getting up in the morning and there's like, you know, little birds on the windowsill and I'm like, good morning. And you know, it's it's more just a, I'm, I'm just content yeah. for the most part. 
That's fantastic. Yeah. Are you able to describe what a sort of typical day might have looked like when you were really ill with BDD compared with what a day might be like now? Well, yeah, How you there, spend there, your time? we might say that those uh, those old days weren't particularly productive. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I remember at the very worst, I was, and I remember looking at, actually timing it, looking back, I was spending eight hours a day in front of the mirror, going back, going to the mirror, back to bed, to the mirror, back to bed on Facebook, you know, looking, comparing with people from from school and, and college, university and that kind of thing. And and this was my, my first stint at, at uni. Um, and I'm very glad to say I, I went back a few years later and, and got my degree, which was, which was great. Um, it sounds so blase. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was fine. No, it, was, it was brilliant. And, you know, I, I think so that was, that was the worst where I, I just could not function. I was... I, yeah, it, it was just, it felt like my head was in cotton wool at all times. And yeah, and then from from now, I mean, I think I just, I suppose I am just living, um, but in the, and I mean that in a, a wonderfully holistic way, like I am, I'm living life, you know, I, I am able to do everything that I was terrified I wouldn't be able to do in the past. So um, I remember during, as part of my therapy, I was, you know, had make a, a exposure checklist, fear checklist, fear hierarchy, that's the one. And at the very top, I was like, there's absolutely no way I can ever shave my head. Absolutely not. I did it more than once, you know, and, and things like that. And I'm like, wow, and this, and it's not like a moment of eureka. It's just like, wow, this is cool. I've done it. And on to the next thing, you know, the, it, the, I suppose I'm just... I say karma, content, you know, as much as anyone else, I suppose, can be. And I think that these experiences, they teach you a, a toolkit to survive the ups and downs in life. You know, I mean, I work as a social worker, so it's, it's bloody helpful. But, you know, you, you learn to navigate things, I think, and support other people with these skills and experiences. And and, and I think, yeah, so that's that was how life is now. It's just, like I said, I just do things. I, go, I don't have to worry about, you know... Uh, 45 minutes of getting ready and will I will I make it out there will I not I I just go and and enjoy it and don't have those sort of shackles anymore and what about things like your friendships and your family and relationships and intimate relationships have you found that everything's just you have a chance to actually have those yeah, good relationships now absolutely. when you didn't before yeah. no yeah. yes no I, do. I absolutely yeah I think my family and I we, we through the, the 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 challenge of it we became much closer and through my friends, I mean, there were a couple of friends I had who unfortunately didn't understand, but I mean, they were teenagers themselves, but those experiences have helped me to solidify those friendships years later. Um, and, you know, in terms of new friends, I actually, I saw a friend yesterday, who's a, a, I suppose a, a new friend who I said, you know, how, how was your, your summer? And he said, oh, you know, all right, uh, I'm sorry, Summer, how was your lockdown? Oh, it was all right, but, you know, apart from the crippling body dysmorphic disorder, I was like, oh, mm. <laughs> that sounds familiar. And it's it's nice how you can then kind of, you know, if they're comfortable to you know, have these conversations with people about and supporting them through those kind of experiences and, you know, in terms of personal relationships and so forth, I, you know, yeah, I think that I'm, I'm very happy to, you know, to date and, and do these these things in life that maybe before... I would worry about judgment and so forth. But now I'm of the mind mindset that, you know, while we are all are part of this system of, you know, as I've said, I think that if I genuinely meet people who are, you know, particularly dismissive or judgmental about appearance, I think absolutely not. You know, you're 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 absolutely not for me. And that's fine. And and being, you know, not letting yourself being you know, in, in dynamics that make you uncomfortable, you know, realise realizing my worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it does sort of change the way you um sort of rate people. No, not rate people in the time right, but sort of decide who's who you want to spend time with, doesn't that? I think. I, yeah. Know, I, I would say that rate people in a way is is, you know, rate in the sense of, you know, yeah. whether who you think I'm all right with that or I'm not all right with that, because I think that there is there is a real you know I think this experience has definitely given me you know real clarity into the keen pain and destructive nature of of people who can be you know when people are bullied and when even even as adults you know when you hear people are like comment on people's 
you know, shapes and size and things like that. I think I understand why we do it because it is just so second nature, I think, as part of society sometimes. But also that doesn't make it, it doesn't make it okay. And, and, you know, calling people out at times and saying, yeah, I don't really think that's all right. And that can feel brilliant because it kind of feels like you're passing it on. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, mm. totally. Just go back to the therapy briefly. So the ERP was really helpful. Why, why do you think that is so effective? So in terms of the, the nature of the disorder, the, you know, in terms of these ingrained thought processes and behaviours, you know, the, the, uh, the obsessions, the compulsions and vice versa, I think that when you challenge those kind of like connections and, you, you know, you, you, and you really face those fears, it's that classic thing, you know, you see in all those you know, kids' movies, when you face your fears. But it's, it's quite literally that, isn't it? I think that um, when you realise that actually, you know, the, the fear that you have drives all of it. Um, and actually when you realise that people don't run in fear when they see your shaved head or they don't, you know, well, I suppose even if people were to, you know, to say something and you could say, you know, this isn't about, this is about me. Um, or, you know, I don't think I really had any, I had, I had someone say to me once, oh my God, but I preferred it when you had long curly hair. I thought, well, that wasn't me. So <laughs> I don't mm. know who you think it was, but, you know, <laughs> so did I looking like, you know, George of the Jungle. But um, yeah, but I, I don't know. I think that just proving to yourself that actually in life, life continues and, and can be bloody brilliant, even if you, you know, go to the shop with your hair that's wet or you, you know, I'm trying to think of specifics now, go to the beach and take your shirt off. You know, I, I think it's, you, I remember thinking that as a nature of this kind of like magnetism from, from the illness where you focus on people you compare yourself to, one of the things I found most helpful to practice over the years is, for example, sitting on the bus and deliberately looking at all the people I wouldn't normally get drawn to and think my god you know I look at look at the diversity of all the people out there shapes and sizes and not one single one of them has any less worth than anybody else even if maybe you know tv shows when I was a teenager told me otherwise you know every single one of these people has the right you know me and you included to enjoy the same activities and to and to feel those you know that that joy from whatever we want to do in life and I think that's that's something that I remember is we're all kind of in our own little worlds, aren't we? But there's a lot of us. And to notice that, I think noticing is is something that's really powerful over time. Definitely. Was there anything else in therapy that you found helpful or anything at any time that the therapist said to you that you thought, right, that nails it for me, you know, that, really, little, that really resonates? Yeah, absolutely. Those sort of aha moments. Yeah, yeah I think um, I had, I mean, he, what was interesting is that the, the therapist... James, he he said to me something like, you know, Andrew, look at me. Like, you know, I've got, you know, look, look, look at my physical appearance. You know, um, I've got a receding hairline, but I'm not worried about it. You know, like, okay, like my teeth are slightly crooked, but I'm not worried about it. You know, like I've got, I love my job. I have a wonderful family. You know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm healthy. And I thought, wow, you know, I, I'd, not, I'd not even looked at him and, and judged him on his appearance. And, you know, similar to that, I had... A, a wonderful moment where they they sort of took some pictures of me where I would sort of style my hair before in this enormous quiff it looked like you know, this tower and um, <laughs> you know terrible like ceiling fans I had to duck out all the time but um you know I had this moment where they took pictures of me before and after I I wet my hair and they then showed these pictures to a series of students at the university you know all very much with my consent and so forth and they recorded the first looking at one picture and then the other and saying, you know, what are your thoughts? What do you think? Do you think, you know, do you, and I think they asked them a series of like positively neutral and positive neutral and potentially you know, negatively intonated questions. And of course, every single one of them in the most wonderful way were like, 